colleague, and I'll have a few more uh, things to show later in the banquet. But for now, I want to introduce the first speaker, Bernard Blümich from Aachen, Germany. Uh, I know him for over 20 years. I once spent a sabbatical in the Max Planck Institute in uh, Mainz, and uh, he was there doing uh, the habilitation. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for being so helpful to me and making me feel at home at the time. And now please give your talk, which will be an NMR at low fields. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the very kind introduction. I mean, it was a pleasure to have you as a visitor. Uh, Gil, happy birthday. It's wonderful that you give us the opportunity to meet and be with you and celebrate that occasion. So uh, my lecture will be on NMR at low fields. We do a lot of work of NMR at high fields with uh, uh, imaging, solid state NMR, spectroscopy, basically the topic of soft matter. And in fact, it was Gilner Von who uh, sort of made that connection by organizing a conference in 1991. I just uh, 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 made sure that this was right. Um, uh, on, on putting together soft matter, like we did a lot of stu studies on rubber and, and stretching rubber and orienting it, and then uh, analyzing, doing NMR methods that also work then on biological tissue with tendon. And so we have a number of publications uh, concerning tendon. Now, I want to actually change the, the contents of the topic uh, learning that there's so much on bone. So I wanted to tell you things that we measured in Herculaneum on old Roman frescoes. I threw that out, and you will get some old bones uh, to look at. Now, this actually is in Herculaneum, and uh, uh, these are magnets just to give you the, the introduction where sort of the evolution goes to. This is a very historical magnet. It's the magnet that Gerlach used in Munich. Gerlach became a professor of physics there in 1929. And uh, uh, that magnet had a long uh, story, you know. It, uh, at some point it went to Königsberg and before the end of the war went to Jena, where it still is. And this is a, you know, one of the modern high field magnets and you can see the evolution is going towards higher and higher fields and more and more money and less and less people that have the privilege to use them. So uh, there is obviously the, uh, the question is, do we need these high magnets, high field magnets, or can we also use lower ones? Here's a little matrix of, of, of current day technology. Uh, uh, basically uh, what I call the large scale NMR, the high field magnets for spectroscopy, for imaging, and for relaxometry, and this is well logging NMR, the logging tool here of uh, Slamberger, the first one. And I've uh, taken these three classes, you know, with highest field homogeneity, lowest field homogeneity, and Nobel prizes associated with each of them. Now there is also technology, a uh, desktop style mobile technology. I only show the work that we have done in Aachen here. Of course, there's other companies and places uh, that do that. It started in Aachen with the NMR mouse, Mobile Universal Surface Explorer, a stray field instrument similar to the logging tool, except that the gradient is much higher and you can uh, you know, do relaxometry, diffusometry of large objects. There's a single-sided tomograph, single-sided uh, spectrometer to measure spectra from fluids in a flask on top of it. And now there's a whole set of closed devices, a core scanner to do relaxometry and drill cores, desktop imager, half Tesla, and uh, a, a desktop spectrometer. I will speak about the NMR mouse and a little bit about spectroscopy. Um, this is uh, uh, just an explanation uh, g giving credit to uh, Bob Kleinberg. In fact, Jasper Jackson had the idea of using uh, magnets in, in logging tools. Here you see one of these logs as going down with, uh, 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 this is uh, the length scale of the borehole and these are relaxation time distributions. Here you see a modern uh, Chinese copy shop uh, building uh, logging tools. And um, the uh, basic concept of, of single-sided NMR is that of stray field NMR. You take the classical NMR arrangement, fold it up uh, the, so that the uh, field lines uh, penetrate the object and they are curved so they're inhomogeneous and the RF field is also uh, operated in stray field mode and then you can measure NMR signals. There's uh, simple versions, more complicated versions, and there is this version with all kinds of shim magnets inside to create a homogeneous field outside in a limited region that is so homogeneous that you can resolve the chemical shift. Now, uh, uh, here I come to Gil, and I apologize that I didn't take the photo from the internet. Uh, <laughs> 
remember this uh, trip in Taiwan when we went through a typhoon and uh, we went out of the bus and this is uh, how Gil appears in a typhoon. And uh, so uh, I took that as sort of the inspiration, just addressing again, you know, the, the, the impact. Many people have used that before me, the word inspiration referring to Gil. And uh, here I want to uh, uh, come to that inspiration and show some early work, start with early work that we did with single-sided NMR on biological tissue. And uh, as well as rubber. So I start with rubber, and here you see an early version of the mouse. There's the magnetic field direction. Uh, these are two magnets over there, and there's an oriented strain piece of rubber with a different direction of an angle theta. And then you can analyze the, the NMR relaxation rate, 1 over T2 from a CPMG sequence or a, an echo sequence, and plot that as a fun function of orientation and a function of, of, of strain. And uh, uh, you see that, uh, you know, there is clearly there's anisotropy in there. You can fit that with an, uh, uh, a function which uh, has an isotropic relaxation rate and an anisotropic one. And the isotropic one seems to follow a first order phase, a second order phase transition, and the anisotropic one a first order phase transition as a function of applied strain. In fact, this is very similar to what you see in terms of the free volume as a function of temperature when you do, let's say, crystallization effects. Um, so this is a kind of interesting uh, basic uh, stress-induced crystallization in natural rubber, a well-known phenomenon. And uh, then we did similar studies on uh, Achilles tendon. In fact, in vivo with a human, that would be this diagram. There are two humans, and you see there's a very high anisotropy. If we take a, a sheep Achilles tendon, then it's, it's less, and uh, with a rat tail, it's even less orientation. In fact, the sheep Achilles tendon and the rat tail could be, mim could be calculated just with a second-order Legendre polynomial. So we didn't have to uh, do any tricks to fit it, but that is not so for the human Achilles tendon. We had to take two second-order on the polynomials, rotate them with respect to 90 degrees, and then we could fit that pattern well. So that means here with the humans, we certainly have that structure. It appeared yesterday in one of the lectures uh, where you have a twisted structure of the, of the uh, collagen fibrils. Uh, that is done in vivo. These are done in, you know, after death, post-mortem. And that may have to do with uh, the fact that uh, uh, the animal was dead, or it may have to do, in fact, with a different tendon structure. That I don't know. We have never figured that out. But clearly, the uh, single-sided NMR allows you to measure relaxation and isotropy, which is difficult to measure in a medical tomograph. Um, now let's uh, go to the improved version. This is improvement one, is what we call the profile NMR mouse. Uh, we arrange the magnets in such a way that we have a slice on top here is the slice uh, drawn where the field is homogeneous in the plane. And uh, that makes it great because then you can basically scan, shift the slice through the object. We do that by mounting the mouse on a lift and uh, uh, measuring slice by slice uh, NMR information, like CPMG trains. And the slice thickness can be reduced to the lowest we got, 2.3 micrometers. A good value is 10 micrometers, uh, uh, which you can measure on solid objects like paintings. Now, I took the painting stuff out and want to show you the mummy work because that comes to the bones. And I got a, 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 an email contact at some point in time where we can measure the famous Iceman, Utsi. Uh, uh, 5,300 years old, and he is in the, in the, in, in the uh, uh, museum in Bozen, Bolzano, northern Italy. And uh, here you see the profile of the Iceman, that's a dark blue curve. And then we measured a human cadaver, which is uh, this fellow here, and he has a light blue curve. And we measured some other skulls, one from the anatomical collection in Zurich, well preserved, one from the Dalheim Monastery, about 1,000 years old, so it was excavated, and that of an Egyptian mummy. And you see all these profiles. And we certainly see a pattern that's repetitive here with high, low bend, don't bend, bone density and high bone density, which basically mimics a cross section through the skull with high bone density on the outsides and lower one, a porous structure inside. So it's pretty clear that we are discussing bone density here. But then the question is, why does the Iceman have a higher bone density? That doesn't make sense. And uh, so we did a study, uh, a freezing study. So we took uh, uh, a section from this uh, well-preserved skull and a section from that uh, skull of the Dalheim Monastery, which is badly deteriorated, and looked at these profiles in the dry state, in the moist state, wet, soaked in water, and then frozen. 
And uh, we see that they're basically, for this skull, the well-preserved one, there's no difference in wet and frozen uh, uh, profiles. But with the, with the other one, there's a big difference. With the, with the frozen one, has less signal. And also, the amplitude is you know, over 60, while here it's uh, below 30. So that means here we have water that freezes at minus 30 degrees, while here there is no water that can freeze at minus 30 degrees. So obviously, we have large pores in here, and we have very small pores in here. And uh, that effect. Uh, that we go to a value of you know, just below 30 with a, a new skull over there, and we compare that to the value that we measure with the ice wind, which is about 30, tells us that the skull of the ice wind is tremendously well preserved, and also uh, most likely that the water in his bones has never been frozen over these 5,300 years. Now, um, we did then a study because we were intrigued by the fact we can measure bone density. Everybody thinks of osteoporosis. And we thought, let's prove that to the medical doctors and measure bone density by micro CT, that's x ray, and compare it with, proton, uh, with, the, with the NMR bone density on expected a beautiful straight line. And we got everything else but a straight line. And the answer is simple. We had that in the lectures yesterday. Bone is uh, 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 organic collagen mainly with hydroxyl appetite. Uh, in, uh, as, as a mineral embedded into it, and the decay which we see here for the bone seems to start first with the organic matter with the matrix, and as the matrix deteriorates, it then releases the minerals, so that they, these are uh, two pieces of complementary information uh, in terms of assessing the quality of bone. The question now is what happens in osteoporosis? We don't have the answer, but maybe somebody else has. Now, given these te techniques, we then looked at the tibia of Charlemagne, and uh, uh, that is in Aachen, and prospect most of his bones there. His teeth are elsewhere in some other churches. And um, so we got the, uh, the, the profile of Charlemagne. That's a dark blue curve. This is a reference tibia. And this is another section of the tibia. And you see Charlemagne had give, gave a beautiful signal. The question is why? Not because he is Charlemagne, but because the tibia obviously had been impregnated with some organic material. So there was a preservation effort, which is undocumented. In fact, this is the first scientific investigation. So far, it only had been opened by the uh, a chapter of the cathedral. And uh, dignitaries have looked at it, but uh, nobody has seriously investigated these bonds. Um, let me now move on with biologic material. We developed recently, this year, a new mouse. In fact, uh, Maxime van Londegem, a, 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 a student who is just going to have his PhD defense very soon, uh, in cooperation with uh, 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 Paris, with, um, uh, he, built, uh, he, co he uh, contributed to building this. We changed the original design with shim magnets so that the profile, the, depth, uh, the, depth, the gradient in the depth direction is reduced by a factor of 10. And also, these magnets are arranged in such a way that laterally over the sensitive slice, we have the same gradient at every position. So we have a truly uniform low gradient within the sensitive volume. And that allows us then to uh, apply the concepts of Fourier imaging in the depth direction. So far, we had to go step by step. That is, uh, we have to scan real space. Now we scan case space in a single shot. So our imaging of depths goes much faster. We can cover a range of two millimeters. And uh, here you see various uh, profiles through skin of different uh, students. And you see they are all different. Uh, the, all the values of the thickness of these different layers are different. And what we plot here is simply the uh, ratio of the, the sum of the red echoes of the lower, later echoes divided by the sum of the, the earlier echoes. I always told Federico and Juan, who came up with this convention, this is a horrible convention. You know, there's no physics behind it, and I don't like it. Uh, then they could show me recently, you know, with the new sensor, you can easily measure the relaxation time distribution versus depth. And it turns out that their function just traces the maxima of that distribution. So this is a beautiful, uh, let's say, a very late uh, argument why that is a good definition. And now I'm happy with it, although I still really don't understand the definition, but it's very practical because it gives you maximum contrast. So this is beautiful work, and you can now ask, uh, uh, there's a reason why you should measure these profiles. And here you see a set of profiles from one person measured at different times, because it only takes 30 seconds to measure one of the profiles. And that's uh, the um, exposure of uh, uh, skin, of the palm of the hand to skin cream. And you see the effect is in the first layers. They get moisturized. So the level moves up. 
Now, when you take water, it also gets moisturized, but not as deeply. You know, this layer here, you know, it's moisturized much less than with skin cream. If you take Dead Sea water, which is also suitable now for the lecture in Israel, uh, then uh, you uh, see that the, 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 the signal actually decays, so the, moist, the skin dries. So one can now also assign kinetics, when you can assign kinetics to each layer of the skin, and in this way characterize the effect of whatever cosmetics. Um, even more, we can now also assign diffusion coefficients as a function of depth. Uh, that measurement takes a little bit longer, it takes about 10 minutes, but again, we have three cases here. We have the case that uh, the reference, this is the untreated skin. You see there are at least two diffusion coefficients in the outer layer, and there's one diffusion coefficient as you go in. This is zero surface, and that's two millimeters inside. The axis is not really very well done, uh, or one millimeter inside, sorry. And uh, then when you take a, have it saturated with skin cream, you see that you now have two diffusion coefficients, and uh, uh, they could be fat and water, we can't assign them, but at least there's a very clear difference, and you also see how far the effect of the skin cream grows. If you only expose it to water, then in agreement with the data before, the moisturizing effect is weaker. You have two diffusion coefficients, but then it stops at about half a millimeter. So this is a beautiful tool now which, which you, with which you now can do kinetic studies of skin uh, in terms of diffusion coefficient distributions and distributions of relaxation times. Now, I want to stay with Strayfield NMR and uh, show there are other ways of Strayfield NMR, and one famous way of doing Strayfield NMR is doing NMR in the Earth magnetic field. So the magnet is a uh, sample is outside the Earth, but the sample is really small compared to the magnet. In the other case, it was the other way around. The magnet was small compared to the sample. So this means now, in, in that case, that our uh, field is really homogeneous, and uh, this is old work, just demonstrated that it works. The ethanol spectrum at high field you're well familiar with, and the uh, uh, Earth magnetic field, it's very complicated as long as there's carbon-13 that breaks the magnetic equivalence. Um, it moves us towards, you know, say, uh, 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 towards doing uh, NMR with, let's say, desktop equipment. You need homogeneous fields. You have to generate them. The question is how well can you do that with permanent magnets. Here's a desktop tomograph. Here's a desktop magnet, half a Tesla, one Tesla field. It uh, has been built by my former students, Federico, Juan, and Ernesto. And this is sort of the inside of the first version, it's just the size of battery, that's a regular NMR sample tube. The trick is to use a Halbach magnet with the magnetization here, and you have uh, uh, positions of mag uh, pieces of magnets inside that can be slid in and out. And uh, in this way you can generate all kinds of shim functions and beautifully shim the magnetic field inside. And this concept now has been realized. This is a 30 megahertz magnet. That's a 40 megahertz magnet with temperature control and additional room temperature shims uh, to come to a commercial product. And you see uh, the single shot NMR spectrum of ethyl acetate or eight scans. Uh, you see the carbon-13 satellites. You have a signal to noise of 30,000 per scan. So this is a beautiful instrument now to do spectroscopy, let's say, under the fume hood. Um, I want to show you one example. Here are my three heroes that the, uh, developed the instrument. And uh, Burkhard Louis was interested in, in the technology, and he developed, uh, uh, let's say, a way of orienting uh, molecules in gels that he embeds in a rubber tube, and then he stretches the gel, and in this way he makes the pores anisotrop anisotropic and the diffusion is anisotropic, so he introduces a residual dipolar couplings. So a very elegant way of doing this. This is his tool set that sits in the NMR sample tube. And uh, uh, we took uh, L-alanine and D-alanine. So in the normal state, when they are isotropic in, in solution, you cannot uh, discriminate the two forms uh, uh, by the NMR spectrum. But when you strain it, then you can look at 2 dj resolved spectroscopy. Here is uh, the, um, here is the uh, 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 J-alpha-beta uh, triplet. Uh, was it? No, three coupling doublet. And uh, you see the, uh, in the unstretched state, uh, there is no difference between uh, uh, if you just have L-alanine or 50% L-alanine or 50% D-alanine. But uh, when you stretch it to 100%, uh, then you can see a nice difference in the spectra. So it's a beautiful example and also shows that the system is stable to do two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy. Um, I now want to move on to the work with Stefan Appelt. Stefan Appelt is a professor in our group, and uh, he does these experiments in interest in very fundamental questions. 
And also the question uh, uh, how we can measure at extremely low fields. That means he, has, he builds equipment to measure at very low field. And in connection with that, we also work on technologies to hyperpolarize. So uh, we share students and uh, uh, share lab space and uh, work together. And the, the, the goal is to say, you know, do we really need these big magnets? Can't we do with magnets like this one, which he designed? Looks like a Helmholtz magnet isn't one. Uh, these are two coils. Uh, just wound uh, high precision coils, uh, uh, laterally uh, relatively wide, and then separated much narrower than the Helmholtz arrangement. But in the center is a homogeneous region, which theoretically has a homogeneity of better than one ppm over one cubic centimeter. And uh, so the work he does there is we do spectroscopy of easy access, and uh, you can vary the field, you know, from the Earth field to higher up. I want to address one uh, thing we, uh, he has done, we have done in collaboration with Berkeley, and that's the question of scaling uh, the magnetic field. So I want to take that as an example, the Earth being the Zeeman field in high field NMR, and then a soccer ball would be the J-coupling, the size of the J-coupling in proton spectroscopy. And uh, so obviously a first order perturbation theory is enough to uh, describe the uh, the, the complete system, the soccer ball has no influence on the motion of the Earth. Now the question is what happens when you reduce the Earth to the size of a ping pong ball? And uh, that is uh, then the case that the Zeeman field is a perturbation to the J-coupling. And uh, that is something that uh, Stefan has worried about and done some theoretical analysis. I have to be very fast now, some theoretical analysis. This is his predicted spectrum at very low field uh, for the ping pong ball at zero field. And this is what uh, has been measured with Mabutka, Alex Pines and the team in Berkeley. And there's beautiful agreement uh, of the lines and the splittings uh, just showing that it works. And the perspective is then, you know, come up with equipment that miniaturizes, make it very small to have uh, a measure NMR spectra at ultra low field at, in a very compact instrument. I should probably skip the para-hydrogen work in the interest of time, as we are kind of late. We're working with contact hyperpolarization to transfer polarization selectively by, 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 uh, by clever chemically designed catalysts uh, onto target uh, chemical groups. And uh, that seems to work at the moment, even at low fields already for the different amino acids. So those have been hyperpolarized. And the perspective that we envision is that we can reduce the magnets even further, either by sort of uh, template self-assembled Halbach magnets, uh, which one can design, or by uh, designing electromagnets uh, very, with very small coils, similar to the, to the NMR mouse, spectroscopy NMR mouse, except you do it on a, on a circuit board or on a single chip. And then you can have, a, have arrays of them for high throughput analysis, and maybe even uh, decide you want to build a quantum computer, although I think this might be a somewhat distant idea. So thank you very much again, Gil, for your inspiration. Thank you for listening. And uh, thank also, thanks also for my students to do the work. We will the work. Thank you, Bernard, for the beautiful talk. And this talk is open for questions, discussion. I can't see. No, I don't see either. Shout. I guess uh, that we do the next lecture. Are you sure you don't want to? <laughs> At the banquet. Thanks, thanks again. <laughs>